Hello, everyone. I'm going to wait for a moment <clears throat> while the while more and more people are entering as attendees. <clears throat> We're up to 100, so we have a wonderful turnout. Let me just wait for more people to enter. So <clears throat> let me uh, kick off the panel while people are still being admitted as attendees. We have a tremendous turnout today because of the importance of this topic. My name is Andy Nathan. I'm welcoming everybody on behalf of the Weatherhead East Asian Institute, which is one of the co-sponsors of this event. Uh, Taiwan has uh, always been a very important subject, uh, both uh, for uh, political science and in terms of US-China relations. Um, but now, of course, as you all know, it's become a hot focus of attention in the United States. And so we're extraordinarily fortunate to have this wonderful panel of experts from Taiwan to tell us how the whole situation looks from their point of view in terms of international relations and in terms of domestic politics. I'm very grateful to them for not for traveling a long distance as they had originally intended to do, but for staying up late to inform us. You'll be able, the uh, members of the audience will be able uh, later on to put uh, questions in the Q&A tab. Um, and I'll uh, select some of them. I'm sure there will be very many questions. I'll select some of them to ask to the panelists in due course. And uh, uh, you could start putting in those questions now if you want and put them in at any time. So with those few remarks, I want to hand it over to Tom Christensen, who will um, introduce the panelists and keep track of time and uh, let us know when uh, audience questions can be considered. Over to you, Tom. Thanks, Andy. Uh, it's a real pleasure. I'm Tom Christensen. I'm the director of the China and the World Program at the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University. Um, this is our first event of uh, the 2022-2023 uh, academic year, and we're really pleased to have you all. We have an exciting uh, set of speakers this, uh, this term, and I encourage audience members to join those other sessions as well. Uh, we have a very uh, fine event today, uh, a Taiwan update uh, discussing the local elections and cross-strait relations at a very critical time for uh, cross-strait relations, for US-China relations, um, and for US-Taiwan relations. Uh, we have a very fine panel and I wanna introduce the people involved, but first I wanted to thank Julie Kwan at the Weatherhead East Asia Institute for all of her good work and uh, organizing this event and to thank uh, Dean Su from uh, ta 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 Taiwan, uh, ta Taiwan University for uh, co-hosting uh, this event. And I'll start my introductions of the panel uh, with Dean Su, who's the Dean of the College of Social Science at National Taiwan University. And everyone knows that NTU is a leading academic institution, uh, not just in Taiwan, but in Asia and the world. And we're really honored by his presence here um, today. Uh, we have uh, a former Vice Minister of National Defense, uh, Admiral uh, Yong Kang Chun, um, uh, who's going to give us a talk in, in, a, in a little while um, on some strategic issues. And we're really honored by your presence, Admiral. I just point out that uh, before becoming uh, Vice Minister of Defense, uh, Admiral Chun was uh, the commander of the Republic of China Navy. We also have Minhua Huang from uh, the Department of Political Science at uh, National Taiwan University, uh, working with Dean Su. Um, welcome. And we have uh, Eric Yu. And Eric Yu, um, uh, uh, Eric uh, Chen Hua Yu, he, he, he is, um, he, I'm sorry, uh, yeah. So he is um, the, uh, returnee to Columbia University. We're welcoming home, although it's electronically, because he is, uh, he is a PhD in political science here uh, at Columbia University. So welcome back, Eric. Uh -huh. uh, we have Ye Zhong Lu uh, from uh, National Zhengzhou University, uh, which many know is a, a leading 
um, uh, institution. He, he works alongside Eric uh, at National Zhengzhou University. Um, it's one of the leading uni universities in Taiwan, and it focuses on political, international, domestic political affairs. And um, if any of you in the audience are scholars and uh, travel to Taiwan, I strongly urge you to visit National Zhengzhou University, which was my first host in Taiwan back in 1990. Um, Andy Nathan, you know, he's the class of 1919 professor of political science here at Columbia University. He's world famous and probably needs no uh, further introduction. And I just wanted to uh, thank everybody for coming. You can see that we have a very prestigious panel. Uh, we have a great event in terms of topic. And I wanted to turn it over now to our co-host, uh, Dean Hong Dasu, um, who was kind enough to co-host this event and to participate in the panel today. Uh, Dean Su, over to you. Okay, thank you, Professor uh, Nason and Professor Christensen. Thank you very much for your hosting, co-hosting this wonderful event at really critical moment on this topic. And uh, uh, thank you for your invitation. And we are really glad to have, um, uh, to have this opportunity to share with you our views and analysis of the subject, which is now really critical, not only to Taiwan, the Strait, but to the region and even to the world. And um, we like to share with you our views and also to discuss with you and listen to you. And now on behalf of the College of Social Sciences of National Taiwan University, and also the team at Taiwan for this panel, I express my gratitude and pleasure. Thank you. We hope a big success for the discussion and the following presentations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It's so over to you, Admiral Chun, for your, your opening uh, comments, and we look forward to uh, learning from you. Thank you. Uh, good morning to our distinguished participants in the United States. I really consider this as a great honor and a pleasure for me to attend this very important event. Thank you very much. Allow me sharing my observation of the recent situation developed across Taiwan Street, especially uh, after Speaker Pelosi's uh, short visit to Taiwan and the PLA immediately conducting so-called coercive operations and uh, joint military exercise surrounding Taiwan in response. Uh, actually, tension is still very high recently and the PRC clearly intend to change the status quo. Uh, planning for a blockade or invasion of Taiwan has long been the highest priority uh, for the PLA's military strategy. Also, the PRC's continual investment and improvement in the anti-access and area denial capabilities designed to prevent the U.S. forces from uh, projecting power into the region to support or defend Taiwan. We're all aware of the PRC's goal really are so-called peaceful unification, but they never rule out the use of a force. Next page, please. Uh, let, let me use the uh, Ukraine situation as example to compare. Uh, very, very little maps can show uh, the Ukraine and Taiwan in the same chart. Uh, actually, we admire and respect their uh, people's uh, strong defense well. They are supporting country can uh, you know, hold until today over uh, 222 days. Uh, I believe uh, the winter before winter is coming, uh, we'll reach it to a turning point, the uh, ceasefire agreement. Uh, Ukraine uh, is a landmaster country compared to Taiwan. The size is about uh, almost 16.7 times bigger than Taiwan. So the, the war and situations are totally different from Taiwan. Ukraine is a uh, so-called uh, airlock landline of communication. They have, uh, I mean, uh, uh, 20 some thousand miles of uh, uh, railway and uh, road connect to their friendly nation, six countries. So uh, the supply support from European country can uh, continue provide to Ukraine, you know, in, uh, insist to again, uh, defeat a, a Russian invasion, but Taiwan is a uh, totally different. Uh, we are heavily relies on the slot sea line of communication. 98% of energy relies on import, over 85% of commerce to the sea lands. So this is a, a totally different uh, case. Next page, please. Uh, next page. Yes. 
Uh, I like to use this uh, view back to the previous one. Uh, yes, I like to use this. I um, mean, the view graph to explain uh, what the current situation we are facing now. Uh, PRC are taking four asymmetrical measures against Taiwan simultaneously, coercing by force, luring by market, compress Taiwan to Washington, excluding Taiwan from international organization. Also, they are a good player of the Sun Tzu out of war. The grand strategy is to outthink enemies strategy, defeat your enemy without fight. The next best one is to break enemies' alliances, also including the line, I mean, the signal of communication. The third one is to defeat enemies' operations plan. Uh, the loss that is from is to besiege the cities. But from this view graph, you will see uh, their measures like uh, we call the uh, anaconda strategy, squeezing, squeezing, shaking your, I mean, the center of gravity offset your capacity and capability. So uh, give an example of course in Taiwan by force, currently they continue enhance, increase the pressure by sending more airplane across the median line or sending the ships, you know, operation around Taiwan uh, nearby waters. Uh, this is kind of attrition war without a fight. Actually, it's a psychological warfare. They try to wear out your spare parts, you know, uh, you, your resilience is gradually, I mean, the wear out. This is uh, the topic. I mean, the, the, they try to impose this kind of pressure to Taiwan in the first hand. Secondly, is try to lure in Taiwan by market. Last year, the try, I mean, the bilateral business, uh, we have the surplus over $171 billion. If we try to relocate this market to other place, we, we need another detailed planning, it takes time. Uh, next page, please. So if something happened in Taiwan Strait, actually it's not a single case, not a single scenario. You can see on the right corner, you see this is uh, the US position versus the China's position, whether you care or you agree or disagree, focus on both Korean Peninsula, East China Sea, Taiwan Strait, and uh, South China Sea. So if the other sides do something, say different things, the scenario will generate to up to 16 different scenarios. I left hand. Actually, our Korean friends is not uh, very much worrying about the Taiwan situation. And the, the people in Taiwan didn't spend much time worrying about, I mean, the Kim Jong-un's nuclear plan. So you will find there are only four, 14 scenarios, but only Taiwan, Japan, and South China Sea are mingled together. And this is also a difficult choice for our American friends to make decision to prioritize how to use the, I mean, the armed forces dealing with this is three scenarios. If happened simultaneously, or even just the two scenarios mingle together. Next page, please. So let me borrow uh, the concept from the uh, United States. Uh, uh, that, that's uh, the strategic plan for uh, Indo-Pacific uh, mentioned by, by your president and your senior leaders uh, saying in four different perspectives, pursue blue economy, prepare for military power, or I mean, protect I mean, the supply chain rules, specs, and architecture, of course, are preventive to the diplomatic positions. If we apply this idea into another scenario, next page, please. Next page. Next page, please. Well, <laughs> Sir, I mean, uh, Dr. Hong, can you go to the next page? 
let me put it this way. In the uh, Indo-Pacific, there are orcas, there are quark, there are five fives, there I mean the American, Korean, Japan, uh, all different organization, or I mean the they are allies, but Taiwan doesn't have a direct connection in between. So in dealing in dealing with the the threat from uh, China, we need the U.S. help us to coordinate with the other nations. In this chart, it, it's kind of a very complicated game theory. We learned from your side from four P's. But in this chart, dealing with the CPTPP, RCEP, or even US initiated new IPATH, dealing with the BRI, what is our position as Taiwan in this uh, very complicated organization? Uh, we have only agreement that with China is ECFA. We like to join the CPTPP, or in the long run, with your support, we can join the IPATH. So we have to understand when US side guidance to preserve peace, truth, science, shared value, interest, and responsibility. Yes, we fully support this uh, great idea. But I'd like to know what kind of costs we have to bear to join this kind of metrics teams. So this is uh, also, I mean, the, the reason why we need uh, have a, a very close cooperation with uh, Columbia University with your support, bring us new ideas. Next page, please. Uh, recently, uh, the PRC uh, launched the 11 missiles, you know, even four missiles across Taiwan. In this chart, you'll see very complicated situation, uh, a lot of a gray zone. We need a clearly definition about uh, um, in the area of responsibility, uh, rule of engagement, uh, different interpretation for the international law. So this is a very complicated situation. And in the long run, the pressure is more and more higher. We need to work together with our American friends, uh, politically, international law, and e even through the commerce, because it's a very easy for the other side to announce a, even just a verbal paper blockade. But through the coercive quarantine to stop one of your LNG ship in somewhere, that will you know, cut the power supply for Taiwan. It's a, the most serious problem we're facing now. Next page, please. So from here, you can see uh, the, the slot, sea line of communication through the east coast of Taiwan and passing through the Tokyo Bay and to the North Pacific. Next. And this is the chart to show when uh, Speaker Pelosi visit Taiwan, where are the uh, Roosevelt, I, I mean, the, or, or the US carrier battle group located? Actually, they're in the circle. I mean, the dot lines in the center position is around the 1200 nautical by from uh, Tokyo or from Guam. Actually, they're good location to check the checkpoint of Miyako Strait and Bashi Channel that can help Taiwan, you know, to stop uh, PRC's uh, carry vertical penetrate to this choke point. US side can helping us to monitor the backyard of Taiwan and uh, we concentrate our capability, protect ourselves, defeat enemy from the Taiwan Street. Next page, please. So, now the challenge we are facing is time is limited, resource limited, how much is enough? It's not only for the military supply. We also need to have uh, uh, energy supply, power supply, medical supply, food supply, other than the military systems. So I believe to build up a affordable, accountable, adaptable, sharp, smart, solid defense force with American teaching us continue in Hence, our capability capacity, not only materially, but also improving our resilience of society is most important. I think this is uh, my last point. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Admiral Chun, for your excellent comments. And um, we uh, learned a lot from your presentation, from your slides, from your discussion. And I will uh, ask the first question and then turn it over to Andy Nathan for a question. And my first question has to do with the military challenges that Taiwan faces from mainland China. Um, there's a lot of attention in the last few years in particular to a scenario in which the mainland launches an invasion of Taiwan uh, through amphibious attack, maybe some airlift with helicopters against Taiwan to, to occupy Taiwan. Um, and there's been increasing discussion of that in the United States since the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Your slides seem to suggest that there's an entirely different scenario uh, in which um, Taiwan is uh, quarantined or blockaded uh, by mainland China. And the question that I have is that uh, I have been impressed with uh, discussions in Taiwan about the overall defense concept uh, by the Tsai administration about the need for an asymmetrical approach to pose a challenge to an invading force against Taiwan. But I haven't heard much systematic discussion from our Taiwan uh, friends and from the Taiwan authorities about uh, the scenario in which uh, Taiwan is blockaded uh, by the mainland. Uh, what is uh, the Taiwan defense community's preparation for such a quarantine or blockade? And is the Taiwan public being prepared uh, through strategic reserves and through psychological preparation for the hardships that might follow such a scenario. Um, because while I, while I believe that uh, Taiwan needs to be prepared to counter an invasion, I believe there are other options for mainland China for which Taiwan also needs to be prepared. And I was interested in your take on uh, what is Taiwan doing to prepare for those alternative uh, military challenges from the mainland besides uh, amphibious or airborne invasion? Well, actually, you hit a very important point. Of course, we need to uh, improve our uh, resiliency, including the uh, power supply, energy supply, medical supply, and the food supply, other than the military equipment. Uh, talking about amphibious landing area, it's very limited. Actually, during the past uh, 25 years, uh, the whole beaches withdraw from 100 meters, even withdraw, uh, we're losing 500 meters of the beaches, but everywhere. And then nowadays, uh, the only things we care is uh, where are our Marine Corps conduct annual exercise. That's the only beach the other can <laughs> conduct amphibious landing. So uh, we have to focus on the energy, uh, not just only for the, I mean, the armed forces, you know, the first line, for sure we have the confidence we can defeat in several battlefields, but we just cannot afford a full-scale invasion. That means we cannot afford a war. The PRC, they may win the war, but eventually they will lose the peace in the whole area. That, that's I admire our American friends try to all the efforts to maintain the peace, secure the peace. But still the question is, uh, what's the cost we need to share, we have to bear. This is a, I mean, the very complicated situation. If really happened, like the worst case, everybody's a loser with a better to, you know, deterrence or build up strong deterrence to defuse crisis before the worst, you know, happen. And the uh, Air Force, Navy, Army are still focused on training, not only for the conventional defense system, but also adopt a new concept, asymmetric warfare concept by using different uh, platform, weapon system, you know, new uh, doctrines. It takes time, you know, at least uh, two, three years. It's not immediately like say uh, you delivered 108, you know, M1 A tank through Taiwan, or another 66 uh, uh, F, I'm um, 16 uh, V to Taiwan uh, training doctrines. 
logistics support, spare parts takes time. So I believe this transition time frame takes uh, two to three years. Time is limited. You know, time is limited. Yes, this is a point I can respond to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Admiral Chen. Um, I'd like to turn it over to Andy for a question and you can run the rest of this session and then I'll start the next one. Oh, um, okay. What's the rest of the session where we take- Well, you can raise the question. There are some, there's one question in the Q&A for Admiral Chen, but maybe we can answer, maybe you can raise that uh, after the other sessions. It's up to you. Uh -huh. Okay. Not sure about time. I think we probably should better yeah. run on to- Okay. Okay. So, um, yeah. So my question would be, and it relates to what you've just said now, but has to do with the will to resist on the part of the civilian population of Taiwan. So we've seen in Ukraine this amazing and I think unexpected will to resist on the part of the Ukrainian people. But as you pointed out in your first slide, the geographic situation is very different. Taiwan is an island. So if, uh, and as Tom said, you may pre-position a number of resources, but um, if there's a blockade or, or an invasion, and I know those are two very different scenarios, from the point of view of this question. But just in general, I've heard two things. One is that the Taiwan people are fierce. They will resist. If, if the mainland occupies Taiwan, they will never control it. The other thing I've heard is the Taiwan people are middle class. They like air conditioning and electricity, and they can't survive for very long. And if there's a blockade, and, that, and if that blockade is not lifted very fast, they will surrender. So what is your own assessment of the will to resist of the people of Taiwan? Well, uh, first of all, I'm pretty confident with the people living in Taiwan. We uh, treasure our democracy system. But uh, like uh, I mentioned previously, indicate because the size is totally different between Ukraine and Taiwan. If we take uh, Ukraine as example, all the 10 large cities being hit by Russian, I mean, either by rocket or uh, by bomber or artillery. You put the case into Taiwan, the collateral damage will cost the total from Keelung to Kaohsiung, the old city will be destroyed. So the people does not have the place to engage a suburban warfare. We do not have this kind of space to accommodate the refugee from an older youngster, but, but the young men, they are pretty much like to even sacrifice their life to defend our own country. Maintain this democracy system is a very strong will to defend Taiwan. So we have to take a different approach. First, uh, prepare more spare parts like a medical supplies, energy supply, food supply, then the military equipment. That will support us, can hold a long time until or our allied countries come to support us because we do not have other line, only sea lands of communication. There's no land traffic the other country can support us. So from the very beginning, we have accumulated enough spares in dealing with this kind of threat. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we should have to move on to the next uh, okay. set of presentations. So we can save those questions perhaps for the, for the end. Okay, that's a good idea. So our, our next uh, panel is on stakeholders' perspectives. Um, and uh, we have a very good panel of four speakers, uh, including Dean Su, who you met earlier, uh, Ye Jong Lu uh, from National Jungju University, uh, Eric Yu from National Jungju University, and I like to say Columbia University as well, um, and uh, Min Hua Huang uh, from National Taiwan University uh, alongside uh, Dean Su. And we'll go in that order, and I'll turn it over first to Dean Su. And if you could turn it over when you're finished to, uh, to Dr. Lu, that would be terrific. Thank you very much, Professor Christensen. And I try to share with you just one slide. Okay. So can you get it? I suppose yes, right? Yes, we got it. Okay. Okay. Uh, and good morning and good evening. 
um, I just share with you following Adam Rosen, um, excellent presentation. I just share with you the two observations. First is the importance of Taiwan at the juncture of the so-called Asian Mediterranean. On this slide, you can see on the right hand, I just show you the strategic importance of Taiwan. In terms of geopolitics, the Sea of Japan, Yellow Sea, East China Sea, Taiwan Strait, and South China Sea, all together constitute an Asian Mediterranean, as shown on the map. Isolating the continental Asia from the Pacific Ocean, one could even argue that without Taiwan, China as a whole is strictly geographically terms and not a Pacific country, as none of its provinces borders directly the Pacific Ocean. The first island chain locks off China from the Pacific, which would implicitly exclude China from the general concept of Indo-Pacific. Narrowly in the Asian Mediterranean, Taiwan is located exactly at the juncture, right in the narrowest part that connects the South and the East China Sea. In terms of political culture, Taiwan is not only a free society with a market economy and a vibrant democracy based upon the rule of law, but also a Chinese society with strong traditions. And Taiwan also plays a key role in the global supply chain, shown now well um, by its importance of producing the semiconductors in the world. So altogether, Taiwan's geographic position, political identity, cultural linkages, and industrial strength all have contributed to the emerging strategic juncture of Taiwan in this Asian Mediterranean in the Indo-Pacific of the 21st century. So that is my first observation. So that means the position of the juncture is not only a geographic position, but also a political cultural position and uh, economic position. Second, over the past four years, we witnessed the rising tensions in Taiwan Strait now becoming one core issue on the global agenda. And this de-Taiwanizing Taiwan Strait is presented with five characteristics as shown on the left side of the slide. And first, I call that internationalizing. Taiwan Strait was a concern of US and uh, Japan and some powers policy, but it did not uh, on the top of their agenda for a long time until very recently when G7 issued a joint statement mentioning their concerns about Taiwan's trade tensions. And, and all coast countries and show their concerns about the status quo and the security of Taiwan's trade. And even European Union published its Indo-Pacific strategy where they link European leaders, linked directly the security and peace in, uh, in Taiwan Strait to the prosperity and the security of the European citizens directly. So I call that internationalizing of the Taiwan Strait and global agenda. Second, prioritizing. Taiwan Strait was not on the top, but now the rising PRC and increasing disputes between the US and China have prioritized Taiwan Strait on their diplomatic agenda. Third, I call that domesticalizing. As a rising PRC with its more assertive war, war style diplomacy, a more authoritarian domestic control, and even a closer relationship with Moscow has alerted the West, making the relationship with China or the attitude, even personal or party's attitude to Beijing, now an issue in the elections. As a result, those statesmen that believed to benefit from adopting more hawkish attitude toward China can manipulate or use the situation in Taiwan Strait for their own purposes. Taiwan Strait now have become an element in some domestic general elections of some countries. 
fourth, ideologicalizing. The Taiwan Strait media line now is not only a division of two politics, but also now a boundary of two worlds, democracy and authoritarian world and even dictatorship. To support or not support Taiwan vis-a-vis -vis the rising tensions in the Strait has become not an interest-driven issue, but a moral issue too. And this ideologicalizing of the Taiwan Strait issue has made any compromise they don't are de-escalation of the tensions Taiwan Strait more complicated and even more difficult. Fifth, last but not least, intertwining with other geopolitical issues. The Russian invasion of Ukraine has alerted the world, particularly the West, of those potentially dangerous regions of fault line countries and linked this war, for example, to the rising tensions of Taiwan. And conclusion, with this rising importance of the juncture in the Asian Mediterranean and the internationalizing and de-Taiwanizing Taiwan Strait, what's for? For Taiwanese, is this de-Taiwanizing Taiwan Strait in Taiwanese interest and contribute to peace and stability of region? It seems pretty problematic. And uh, we have to discuss and need more options. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Su. I'm going to turn it over now to Professor Liu uh, from uh, National Jung from from uh, National Zhengzhou University. Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Christensen. Uh, first of all, I would like to express my gratitude to uh, Professors Nathan and Christian Christensen for hosting this event, and uh, thanks to uh, Dean Su for uh, inviting me to join uh, our uh, Taiwan panel. Um, for my uh, job here is trying to explain uh, Taiwan's general public's view of the United States, uh, especially in the aftermath of Speaker Pelosi's visit to Taiwan. Um, during this period of time, uh, we witnessed that, uh, of course, it is an enhancement uh, in U.S.-Taiwan relations, and this is a good and totally welcome by uh, all people in Taiwan. Uh, no, uh, especially for political elites. Uh, I would say this kind of welcome is actually uh, cross-partisan in Taiwan. Um, however, um, throughout uh, latest surveys conducted by different institutions in Taiwan, I noticed that um, there were a lot of interrelated questions reveal certain kind of um, uh, public opinion that might be a little bit ambivalent uh, on those issues. Uh, so let me um, provide some of uh, my observation to, to, all, to all of our audience. Uh, I actually reviewed the surveys from uh, the Chinese Association of Public uh, Opinion Research, uh, the Taiwan Public Opinion Foundation, and also uh, Commonwealth, uh, the magazine, and also Global View Monthly, uh, et cetera. And uh, I found there were five interrelated uh, questions. Uh, Taiwan's general public's res respondents to that uh, is quite interesting. First of all, uh, when it comes to the question of uh, the likelihood of China's invasion uh, in the short term uh, to Taiwan, uh, more than 60% uh, of the respondents said, re replied that they do not worry about it. And along uh, in this line of reasoning, when it comes to the question of, are you worried if in the long run that uh, PRC is going to exert uh, its force uh, for unification? About 58% of the respondents replied, they, they think this is not likely. For the second question, uh, also very, very interesting. If uh, China's invasion occurs, will the United States come to Taiwan's rescue? More than 60% of the respondents replied, yes, they believe uh, the United States would come to Taiwan's rescue. And this answer actually uh, is highly divided across uh, the partisanship and also uh, the age uh, of the respondents. 
if the respondents are leaning to DPP and uh, also, uh, and especially for the younger generation under 40 years old, uh, they were quite uh, believe, uh, believe that the United States would come to the rescue. However, uh, this question, um, Taiwanese general public's view on this is also shaped uh, by the Russians' invasion of Ukraine uh, in February. Right after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the number dropped to 35% in March, but it gradually comes back to 44% in August after Speaker Pelosi's visit. The fourth question that I also found very interesting is whether Taiwan should be choosing sides between the United States and China. For about 64.2% of the respondents replied, they want, to, they want Taiwan to maintain friendly relationship with both sides, with both the United States and China. Among these respondents, the supporters for KMT uh, are even more so leaning to having friendly relationship with both sides than the DBP supporters. The fifth question, uh, also very, very interesting and highly related to Admiral Chen's uh, presentation earlier. It is about Taiwanese people's self-confidence in Taiwan's military capabilities. For the respondents, however, about more than 60% of the respondents reply that they have no confidence in Taiwan's military capabilities, even though the majority still uh, consider themselves have the willingness to defend Taiwan. Among these questions, it is also noted that it is quite uh, divided among partisanship. For KMT supporters, usually they tend to see China as a real threat. And for the unification by force, it, it, it is a present danger to Taiwan. However, for DPP supporters, usually they think uh, it is very unlikely for China to invade Taiwan one way or another in near term or mid or even long term. However, for DPP supporters, they have stronger belief in that the United States and in some cases, Japan would come to the rescue. So this kind of public opinion uh, polls revealed how divided and polarized Taiwan's Taiwan society is right now. So to me, my observation is maybe we need to think about two things in the future. And I will conclude my presentation with these two points of thought. First, complacency breeds contempt. Ambivalent, if not polarized views of the general public as reflected on the issues over likelihood of Chinese invasion and over the US role as mediator, mitigator, or guarantor varied over time and political spectrum. This may not be able to formulate a clear way of thinking on the cross strait relations for Taiwan. Second, how to bridge these differences within Taiwan's society? To me, at this moment, it seems to be a mission impossible. Maybe we need to wait for the other shoe to drop and local elections on November 26th will be a very good point for observation. So I'll stop here. All comments and questions are welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Liu. I now want to turn it over to uh, Eric uh, Chen Yu. And I, I also wanted to point out that he is at, not just at National Jung University, but he's also um, at, the, um, at the election study center there. So he's particularly qualified to discuss our main topic today. 
Welcome back to Columbia, Eric, even though it is uh, virtual. All right, thank you very much. And it's my, it's all, uh, my great pleasure to participate in this uh, important event. I think maybe this is the, the first uh, seminar conference that I participate hosted by Columbia after graduation. So uh, it's a interesting feeling now. So today I want to talk a little bit about, uh, try to give you some update about Taiwan's domestic politics particularly focus on public opinion. As a, uh, does the, the screen move? Okay. okay. Yeah, so, it, uh, it's working, yeah. Okay, so I will briefly talk about some major political cleavages and uh, talk a little bit about the local elections and speak about the future attitudes toward China versus US. Okay, I because I am uh, I'm I have a, I'm also a researcher, a research fellow of Election Study Center. As many of you of the audience know, that Election Study Center produced this long-term trend of uh, major political cleavage in Taiwan over a long time since uh, 1992. So we just have a, a new update data points uh, two uh, three months ago. So you see this uh, long-term trend, and this is uh, the figure for party identification. You see that uh, uh, the decline of the, the pan blue, the blue line indicates the decline of the pro, uh, pan KMT camp um, still, still exists. And you don't see, uh, you don't see the pan blue, uh, the, the support of the pan blue increase over the past several years. And even though you don't, you see that a little bit uh, small decline of the green supporters, but still uh, blue supporters, uh, uh, only uh, now only about 14% of the blue supporters among the uh, voters. And you see a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, people claim themselves as independent voters. But the bottom line here is that regarding the the uh, party party configuration, you don't see the K pan KMT uh, supports increase. And here is a small line for the uh, uh, for the Ke Wenzhe's, uh TPP Taiwan People's Party, and uh, it seems to be on the increasing trend, but uh, we still don't know. And this local election will be a great test of the strength of the TPP. So next is. Uh, Taiwanese Chinese identity. Again, we, we see the, uh, oh, again and again, over the past few years, we do see an increasing trend of Taiwanese identity. And uh, even this, uh, the, the past, the recent surveys data we collect indicates that, uh, indicates the highest point of Taiwanese identities. Now it reached to 66 point. And uh, the dual identity, we, in the sense that some people claim themselves both Taiwanese and Chinese remain like one third of the, uh, of the uh, general public. So uh, we do observe um, an increasing trend of Taiwanese identity and now it's up to the highest point. Next one is uh, attitudes toward cross-strait relations. And there is a big jump on big jump of support for uh, independence, uh, particularly during the um, years of two, uh, 2020. And this is, we, we hypothesize that this is mainly because of the Hong Kong incidents. And, uh, and you see the big jump over here uh, from uh, 2018 to 2020s. And then it remains a kind of stable so now about 30% plus of the uh, general public supports uh, Taiwan independence, even though uh, maintain the status quo still the majority, uh, it's still over 60%, but uh, this is a, but the, the big jump of pro-independent supports uh, uh, kind of, is kind of a major feature over the past few years. And this is a question somehow related to Ye Zhong's uh, uh, his own survey, but uh, I try to give you a, a longitudinal data 
and uh, it's about the conditional self-defense determination. The bottom line here is that no matter uh, Taiwan declared, uh, announced independence, caused the mainland China to use force against Taiwan, or uh, mainland China uh, uses force against Taiwan for unification, the majority of the peoples uh, wants to uh, defend them, uh, ourselves. The majority of the Taiwanese wants to defend ourselves. And even though there are some kind of uh, difference, difference in terms of the degree of support, but the bottom line is the majority, over 60% of the people wants to uh, fight for Taiwan. So about next, about the local election, um, even though some people argue that local election could be a, uh, a test for the for uh, future um, uh, future uh, central government elections, but that kind of referendum theories really hold really holds. I just uh, conduct uh, um, longitudinal analysis and it indicates that the major factors that affect the local election result is a local government's performance. So all politics is local, seems to be held in Taiwan. And for this, uh, for the upcoming elections, um, I think we should focus on six metropolitan areas because uh, those areas, areas are consist of 70 plus of the population. And two major battles, one is the Taipei city uh, mayor election, that's a three-way race. And also a Taoyuan city, metropolitan area, uh, Taoyuan city mayor election. That's even a four-way race. And those two races are supposed to be close. And it's really, uh, it's still too early to call, uh, too early to make a prediction who will win the elections. And we should uh, keep our focus on those two uh, metropolitan areas election. And uh, as I mentioned that, uh, all politics is local. So local elections result supposed to be remain in the local, uh, somehow still remain the local, um, local level, but uh, it still has some implication for the future for the next uh, presidential elections. So I will say that if DPP loses both key battles, of course, President Tsai will become a lame duck president and we will observe multiple candidates from the DPP will emerge. And if DPP wins both key battles, uh, Tsai, President Tsai will have a strong influence on determining her predecessors in the, uh, in the 20, uh, 2024 presidential election. And if DPP lost one and wins once, and President Tsai will still be a lame duck, but it depends on the winning and losing margin. That's my, uh, uh, my take for the regarding the implication of local elections. But on the opposition side, it's still unclear. So uh, let me go to my final parts. In, after the 2020 uh, presidential election, we had a face-to-face uh, -face surveys about people's attitude toward China versus US. And the result clear indicates that the, the positive uh, positive numbers means uh, favorable attitudes. Negative numbers uh, indicates uh, unfavorable attitudes. So the majority of the people wants to build a closer tie with, uh, with the US. But um, regarding the China, attitude toward China, it seems to be a little bit more, a little bit polarized. You see that some people uh, really don't want, want to keep distance from China, but some people want to build closer tie with China. And then I will skip these parts. The bottom line is here is that from the 2020 surveys, we do see that pro-US attitudes is greater than pro-China's attitudes among the general public. And, and over the past two years, we do see that the Taiwan and the US try to build an even closer ties. That ref somehow reflects uh, uh, people's attitudes. And even though there are some differences among different age groups or partisanship or among a different political cleavage. But uh, I think the majority of the Taiwanese are, have a stronger pro-US attitudes rather than uh, strong uh, pro-China attitudes. And because of that kind of attitudes uh, re regarding the uh, 
2024 presidential election, I don't see um, much chance to elect a pro-China president in 2024. That's my uh, final take. I will stop here. Thank you, Dr. Yu. And uh, our final speaker uh, in this panel is Professor Minhua Huang uh, from uh, National Zhengzhou University Department of Political Science. And I will turn it over to you, uh, Professor Huang. Okay. Um, it's good to be here. Eric, could you close your sharing? Eric? Okay. Um, I'm going to share my PowerPoint slide, but I, I'm going to wait for Eric to close the sharing. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how to uh, close it. Uh, hold on a second. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, in terms of division of labors, um, actually, um, I'm going to talk about the shareholders' perspective from um, China's point of view. Okay. Uh, the first thing I want to say is that um, China is really a very um, complex and complicated countries. Okay, so you see there is a Chinese mosque look like a Taoism shrine, and this, there, in, in the right you can see the used mouth. So I'm going to share with you my own take as a scholar from Taiwan, but look at how China view the reason, you know, the escalation, how they think of it. Okay, so I think from Xi's perspective. His security of powers and tiny achievement of China's grand, grand national goals is in critical moments are the ultimate consideration. I think she, in multiple occasions, say in 2021, he has already achieved moderate prosperity in no all aspect, right? But in 2035, he got he, he got to realize the socialist modernization, as well as in uh, 2049, he going to realize the uh, the Chinese string of great Chinese national rejuvenation. So all those are the promise to the Chinese people. So unifying Taiwan is an important goal, of course, but there are, uh, there are lots of other important goals as well. These goals are interrelated. So achieving them in a balanced way with a proper pace, the key word is proper pace, is essential to Xi's journey to success. So which means if you attack Taiwan now, but uh, you will make your economy back to, you know, to 1990s or 2000, early 2000, then it won't change. It, will, it won't achieve that uh, great, you know, Chinese rejuvenations, right? So all those things are interrelated. The bottom line to the Taiwan issue, I think, uh, we need to think about what defines the red line for, 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 for Taiwan issue, okay? And could China achieve this goal alone? And also, what is the cost-benefit calculation of the grand national goals if achieving this goal too soon or too late at a particular moment? What I'm saying is that I think China, at a particular moment, they have priority in their mind, and also uh, the, the due pace they should, the, the due progress they should achieve. So all those things you got to remember is that when China uh, facing with all the uh, situation, how they will, go, how they are going to respond. I have three observations. I think the first uh, regarding the Taiwan um, issue, sovereignty and U.S. commitment to defend Taiwan militarily is the red line. It hitting those two points, which, which China got to respond, okay? And I think China in 2019, particularly in the New Year's talk, she has already proclaimed he's going to pursue uh, uni unilateralism in managing the cross trade issues, okay? And China uh, for the past several years neglects Taiwan and, and the Taiwan Authority, Taiwan's government, but gradually doubts US credibility as reliable chess player. I, I mean, for the Biden administration, I think, um, you know, uh, China has a high hope, but let down a, a lot. In recent negotiation, they found that the uh, Biden probably won't be able to be a credible, you know, the, uh, the ne negotiator. So this is a big problem for China. So China need to achieve comfortable gains if encountering, if encountering challenges, for example, uh, erasing the imaginary median line in the cross strait is a good enough deal to respond to Pelosi's visit in Taiwan. So what I'm saying is that when China feel being challenged or they, 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 they feel they lost something, okay, for example, like this time, uh, the Pelosi, a lot of uh, the, the delegate team, U.S. delegate team actually visiting Taiwan and kind of uh, stepping the, 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 the red zone. So China trying to, 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 to gain something back 
in order to justify that they're still in charge, still in control. So I think right now it's still an ongoing chess game between China and US. And China kind of see, perceive Israel in playing defense um, rather than offense, okay? So that's taking the Taiwan Policy Act and, as an example. It's quite revealing that US also understand China's red line, okay? On the issue of sovereignty, US military engagement. So you can see for the past two days, the, uh, the US administration kind of uh, played down those two you know, we're hitting the red red line, kind of um, uh, the the points, and and when when they when they agree with the uh, the the bill. However, the proposal of the bill itself and its timing is likely to be viewed as a gaming strategy to exert maximum pressure on the eve of twenty party congress for Xi's power consolidation. I, I think, for China's perspective, uh, they are under siege and they are being taken advantage uh, during this critical moment. This is. For China, they are trying to defend. I think China might further react to the past of the Taiwan Policy Act, okay? But in a way that she thinks manageable, for, for instance, continuing demonstration that China can unilaterally resolve the Taiwan issue through intensive military exercise. So I think they will keep doing it. And even no matter how close to the uh, 20th Party Congress, they were still doing it, okay? Even doing it harder, or more you know, frightening to Taiwanese people. However, I think they still hold on the strategic pay, patience, okay? So all those is, is going to demonstrate that they have um, capability unilaterally instead of real uh, trying to taking over Taiwan, okay? And I think meanwhile, China will seriously assess the pros and cons for the possibility of resolving Taiwan issue via different scenario. It's going back to Admiral Chen's a lot of scenarios, maybe blockade, maybe you know, taking certain offshore islands. There are a lot of different strategies they can uh, achieve the same result, causing the, the panic in the island. I'm going to give you a very bold and the, uh, uh, you know, some prediction in short and medium term within five years, okay? I think China is going to straightening out all the parameter in the US-China rivalry, particularly after US 2024 presidential elections, because um, I think the Biden administration really let down China. China wanted to have a credible, you know, the, uh, the, the counterpart, they, they, they can negotiate, can manage close trade relationship. Who will win 2024 Taiwan's presidential race, despite the fact that China does leave certain space for future negotiation, is largely inconsequential. I think China really think that Lai Qing, the, the DPP most promising candidate, might have real chance to win. So did not actually list, blacklist him, okay, as the egregious, some kind of uh, proponent for the, uh, uh, the, the independent, Taiwan independence. That is leaving the space for future negotiation. But I don't think even Pen Bu or someone, you know, much more leaning toward uh, unification, you know, candidate, if, if, if once got elected, would change anything, okay? And I think China will keep advancing its unilateral capability to resolve the Taiwan issue. China might consider taking over Taiwan if cost is low enough or the benefit becomes huge enough. So it all depends on the cost and benefit calculation and also associated with domestic dynamics in, 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 in mainland China. Finally, in the long term, I think before 2035, conflict might be inevitable if peace or invocation pace of unification for sure of China expectation. I think China has a clock, and, but he's not really specifying uh, specifically, but in their mind, they have a pace. And once they feel the pace is too slow, they will come up with certain idea to coerce Taiwan. So I think before they taking any um, non-peaceful action, China will coerce Taiwan, getting on the negotiation table to talk about uh, unifications. And, and there are some, you know, uh, factors, and, and we, we, we definitely should look, look out. She's health and age will become important factors that bias the cost and benefit calculation, tilting towards preference on unification by military forces. So I think uh, by the 2032, I think she has already 80 years old. At that time, the health and also the age factors will really, really uh, propel, you know, China to become really, uh, anxious and uh, if, if uh, unification progress is not, you know, they are not happy with. So all those two facts, I think we should be very careful. 
All right, I stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Huang. Um, this was a terrific panel. Thanks to all the panelists. Um, the the agenda calls for uh, Andy, Nathan, and uh, and and me to uh, uh, ask a couple of questions. And I will start with one question and turn it over to Andy. And my question is really about 2024. Uh, a lot of you touched upon the local elections this November and the potential implications for 2024. I had a more sort of abstract question, which is, um, it's pretty clear to me, having observed his public statements and um, uh, having met him, um, that uh, the KMT chairman, uh, Eric Drew, is trying to portray himself as uh, somewhat different from previous KMT leaders on cross-strait relations and uh, emphasizing uh, his uh, strong relations with the United States and his uh, wanting to paint a, a platform that says that we're not pro-China, we're pro-America. Um, I'm wondering whether our experts believe that such an approach um, will be well received in the Taiwan public um, uh, as a strategy on cross-strait relations, whether it will uh, convince people that he is somewhere between uh, where President Ma was uh, in office and where President Chen Shui bian was in office um, uh, before President Ma, and uh, whether that will be rewarded as an electoral strategy. And is there anything related to the local elections in November that would touch upon that issue? That's, that's my one question. And I'm gonna turn it over to Andy for his, and then I'm gonna ask Andy to look through the Q&A questions as well and maybe pluck a few of those out uh, for, the, for the panel. Um, well, you, uh, we want to- Andy, get... why don't you ask your question now and then they can answer both both of our questions and we oh, can turn to the audience. Anyway, I see a bunch of good questions in the Q&A. So uh, perhaps uh, your question should be answered first and then I'm going to pitch, I uh, can combine some of the questions from the Q&A. Okay. Uh, yeah, so who should answer your question? I guess. So what are the fortunes of the KMT and how convincing will this strategy be that uh, there's a kind of new KMT position on cross-strait relations? And Maybe that relations? goes to Eric. <laughs> yeah, I, I will answer this question yeah. simply by show uh, one slide that I, I, I actually uh, quickly overlook. And this is a slice uh, about the uh, attitudes toward uh, U.S. and China, and blue lines indicate uh, the, the more favorable attitudes toward China, if that positive, and green line means attitude toward the U.S. Here is the KMT. You see that KMT is kind of highly divided. So there are a bunch of people who have a strong, um, uh, favorable attitude toward U.S. and, and, and mainland China. And DPP is, is very clear, right? The, some people, uh, the same people, same group of people, DPP supporters, simply favor the U.S. and they have a negative attitude toward mainland China. So you see that's kind of a, a clear, very clear for DPP supporters, but it's highly divided for the KMT supporters. That's why it, even though uh, Eric Chu tried to move, shift uh, KMT toward uh, favorable uh, toward U.S., but again, in in my opinion, the KMT on that issue is highly divided. So it's still a long way to go for Eric Chu if he wants to do so. I would okay, thank you very much. I think I think we should really get the audience <coughs> questions on the table. And um, Andy, I'll leave it leave it to you to try to uh, coordinate those questions and maybe combine a few. Um, yeah. And over to you, Andy. Okay, let me try to combine a few. So first, uh, since we have Eric uh, answering questions, um, let me ask a few. So um, Judy Liu uh, wants to know how Chinese identity is defined in your survey, because there are different meanings of the idea of uh, Chinese identity, potentially. Uh, it could mean identifying with the PRC. It could mean identifying with the Republic of China. It could mean having an ethnic ethnic Chinese identity. So how do you ask that question and how do you interpret the answer? Um, a second question, Eric, uh, from Chengzhu in, in Chengzhu, if you have anything on this is, 
how the Taiwan public assess the, the uh, recent military exercises on the part of uh, mainland China, do they think it's really dangerous or do they think it's just a bluff? And then Zhuo Park asks a question also about whether the local elections matter for cross strait. I think you said that in the local elections, the, the cross strait issue is not really a deciding issue. How much does foreign policy generally, so cross strait US uh, and so forth, play in these elections? Do the local candidates take a position on these foreign policy and cross strait issues? Um, and does that affect the vote in any way? And then I think this kind of converges. So I'm asking, a, I guess, a four part question here. And the last part of it is mine, which is, um, uh, which is to say, do do the voters, so all, it seems to me that all candidates, DPP and KMT, uh, do not present a clear position on cross straight. They all kind of fudge the issue. Um, do, do the voters perceive uh, an actual policy difference the DPP and the KMT both want stability. They neither of them wants war. Neither of them wants unification. Um, do, uh, they, are they fudging? And do the voters see them as actually presenting a different position on 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 Taiwan's uh, status in the world and cross strait relations? So that's a bunch of things. Answer as much of it as you can in brief <laughs> form. All right. Uh, let me uh, go to the, the first question. That's a quick question. What's the, the, the actually meaning of the, those kind of identity? Uh, our question actually goes, for, goes to, uh, do you consider yourself Taiwanese or Chinese? Because we start that questionnaire uh, since uh, 1992. So uh, I do believe that the content of the, that kind of identity indeed change over time. So. Uh, the the uh, I do agree with that that kind of assessment, and uh, I we have a focus group on that that kind of issue. And normally, up to now, some people think of uh, beforehand people think Chinese identity has more cultural meaning, but now it's almost uh, uh, it's it's almost it's mainly a political meaning. So Chinese identity somehow indicates PRC's identity. But for those people who do have a dual identity, they are kind of divided. They consider themselves politically as a, uh, in Taiwanese as, as a political sense, but Chinese as a culture, culture sense. But again, our questions are not able to help us differentiate those two, two type of identities. The second thing about military exercise, I actually have a data about that, but it's not a data uh, owned by uh, election study center. So I will not able to show here, but uh, about the, the uh, PRC's military exercise, people in Taiwan do not uh, bother that much. And um, because I, I think because people kind of get used to that even, but however, people do worry about that but get used to that, that's, uh, that's the general attitudes. The second, the third thing about the, uh, the local election, as I mentioned that the local elections now, uh, up to now, I think uh, local elections remain uh, local elections. There are not much debates about the cross regulations or national identity issue so far. As Andy just uh, uh, argued that the, uh, it seems to be, it seems, that candidates are trying to uh, somehow avoid to take uh, clear positions on that. The only thing that you can, the only thing you can observe is uh, that the KMT's uh, candidates use ROC quite often, and uh, and uh, DPP's candidates use Taiwan more often. That's type of uh, that's kind of a use. Uh, they tend to use those labels to. Uh, uh, to paint their themselves rather than have a uh, clear arguments about uh, future cross relations, and so they they seem to take take side take safe safe sides, and uh, but I I do, but the bottom line here is that 
for the in terms of cross trade relations issues, I uh, I don't see it's important in local elections. It's not going to be a uh, because we don't have Han Guo that type of candidates in these elections. So those kind of uh, uh, identity issue would not would not be a uh, uh, important issue in this local election. That's my assessment. I'll stop here. Okay, thank you. Um, let me pitch a few questions uh, to Admiral uh, uh, on the military side. So <clears throat> one of them, I don't know if you uh, can, you know, can are willing to answer all of these. Sure. But the first one comes from Shaolin Li. Are there already U.S. military personnel in Taiwan? If so, how many? As far as I know, that's public information that they, they are there, but perhaps I don't know. So that would be interesting. Uh, we have a question from somebody whose last name I think is Hui. I'm not sure I can read this character, Hui Fu Gao uh, for Admiral Chun. Um, what lessons do you think China has learned from the Russian invasion in Ukraine that they might apply toward the Taiwan issue? Has the Russian experience in Ukraine have any relevance for Chinese? For example, we often hear that uh, the Chinese leaders would be shocked that the Russian military was so ineffective. And so they might think, well, our own military maybe is not good. But this is a much broader question if there's anything that has been learned. A, a person named Ma Hua Ching from Columbia Journalism School wants to know whether the, the shooting down of a drone, of a Chinese drone uh, recently on, I forget which island, um, uh, off of the Chinese mainland, do you think that Beijing would retaliate? Is this a sort of step into war? And another question from Oliver Magnuson has to do with the training of the Taiwanese population for resistance. So I know there's some voluntary civil civil training, voluntary training for civil resistance. There's discussion of increasing the amount of time that Taiwanese young men have to serve in the military, and there's resistance to that political. Re so how are the Taiwanese population, in your opinion, as a military professional, adequately tr getting adequate military training to mobilize and defend in case of an attack? As, and do as much as you, you know, answer as many of those as you might be able to or willing to. Thank you. Well, the first question uh, asking how many United States uh, soldiers or uh, armed forces in Taiwan to support in the training, you know, now I'm a private citizen, already retired for many years. Uh, I do not have this kind of figure. So uh, the question number one, I uh, just cannot uh, respond uh, properly. The second, uh, what kind of uh, lesson Chinese learn in uh, Ukraine? Uh, we, we have to really understand the Russian purpose is really try to, I mean, the formally uh, recognize the two independent state like uh, uh, in the Donbas area. The totally case is different from Ukraine and Taiwan. So Chinese learned is there's a no, I mean, the quick attack, not so easy from a exercise transformed to a full-scale invasion to Taiwan, I believe they fully understand. So coercing by force, increasing, I mean, the pressure, exhaust your material, I mean, exhaust your morale is more easy than try to really try to defeat your enemy, but the cost is too high to bear. I think uh, their long-term goal still, emphasize on the unification, but uh, not never renounce the use of the war. I think a short term uh, within two, three years, uh, the, the possibility of the miscalculation or conflict still there, but the chance is very low. Uh, what is the number four question? Can I ask it again? Um. What was the number fourth? Is is the the sh the shooting down of a drone? Is is that um 
is that okay. going to trigger a war? Uh, okay, uh, actually, this is a, a very, very small drone in the offshore island outside the Kingman called the uh, Lion Rock, a uh, small rock island. So this is another a symbolic, uh, I mean, the, uh, the conflict, uh, I mean, the, the issue will account for whether you shoot down or let it uh, flown away. Uh, actually, uh, the other side, the civil air uh, authority immediately announced a 10 years uh, constraint, a restriction to prohibit the local people. This is a civilian toy. It, it's, it's not a military drone. So, so there, there's a no reason for the other side to engage any retaliation. A another issue also mentioned uh, regarding to the territorial defense force. And now more people like to join this kind of training. Uh, one of the issue is that they really need to engage some uh, life fire training. Uh, one year, how many bullets they can shoot. Now they are using the tool, I mean the simulator. It's a good for very beginning, but it's not enough to train a qualified, I mean the uh, territorial defense force uh, members. Thank you. Uh, great. Okay, I have <clears throat> a few questions for Minhua. I think here. I mean, everybody might want to talk about this, but I'll just pitch these questions to Minhua. So, Minhua, you said in one of your slides that China is using faith in the U.S. credibility, and that could be interpreted as saying uh, that um, that China doesn't think the United States will. Uh, you know, the United States promise to uh, uh, defend Taiwan, not a treaty promise, but a sort of political promise that China thinks the U.S. is bluffing and it won't defend Taiwan. But I think what you meant by that is that China has lost faith in the ability of the United States to restrain itself from exacerbating the Taiwan problem. Uh, so I want to get that clarification what you meant by that and then to ask you whether you feel that uh, or th that that Taiwan is being take being used as a political tool by some American politicians in a way that's not in the interest of Taiwan and which is putting Taiwan in trouble um, which comes to a question by one of our audience, Hu Chen Xu. Would you think it's a good idea for the US to shift from existing strategic ambiguity to strategic clarity? As you know, there's a, a big debate over this and some uh, people in Congress and some people in think tanks think that we should deter China by making clear that if China attacks Taiwan, we will militarily defend, which is something that the United States has not officially made clear before, even though President Biden has sort of said it, but then the State Department and White House walked back what he said. Our official position remains strategic ambiguity. Minhua, should we abandon strategic ambiguity? Would that be in Taiwan's interest? Okay, um, I'm going to address those three. First question, I think your interpretation actually is my meaning, which is that China kind of fed up with uh, Biden, failed to control the domestic situation that leading to escalation of close trade. From China's perspective, I think Biden not being able to restrain or to, you know, to skillfully to, to, to moderate, mitigate uh, the escalation escalation actually the blend should be on the biden because he cannot i mean the state department and also blinken and also they, they all do different things there from biden you know probably when 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 they have negotiation with the uh, xi jinping and as well as the uh, china authority so so beijing kind of uh, you know this is what i mean the in, in terms of credible you know the the chess player because they they kind of thinking they doing one thing but the uh, they're saying one thing and doing another okay so this is what I mean the second thing I think definitely um, you know Taiwan being used by domestic politician in U.S. but there's a fatigue effect except for the Pelosi you can see 
there are numerous, uh, you know, team coming to Taiwan. And there are, uh, you know, for the news report, we see there are a lot of other interests piggyback on those visits. And all those piggyback interests for Taiwan public is really, really bad marketing because when they come, they, you know, asking Taiwan buy something or asking Taiwan, you know, <laughs> certain favor. I mean, this is, I, I know that they might be uh, correct information or genuinely, but I think that fatigue effect is genuinely happen. We can, we, we, we can see more pool, uh, do more pool to see whether that happens or not. So that's the result. Why I would think that why Taiwan people so, you know, so, so feel not, not being affected by the escalation. We, most of in our society kind of surrender, surrender, not really panic, not really, you know, you know, by affected by, 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 by the military exercise. I mean, so part of the reason is fatigue. Finally, I think one thing I really uh, uh, think that uh, is there still any triangle, strategic triangle relationship between Pearl Strait, like Taiwan, US, China? I, th I the view I see it, it now become you know only uh, US and China, and Taiwan become protege. What I mean protege is that Taiwan lost his independence, lost his the um, leverage to do anything that different from you know US point of view or so that's really bad so that is the result why china you know don't really want to take care uh, uh, caring about any domestic development in taiwan uh, so, so there's an audience I, I see another question whether uh, knt will be able uh, to rebuild the, uh, the the peaceful relationship uh, goes back to ma ma injo as a president i am very pessimistic that is because in terms of 92 consensus right now the narrative in taiwan is um, china definitely not agree to disagree because in taiwan we all know is agree to disagree we don't if we don't want to specify the real what china is at least we agree to disagree but right now china say very clear not agree to disagree so and and taiwan people very very clever all know this so that's that, that i think that's part of the reason why in Jianhua, in, in every use, pool is showing that the, um, those people, when they don't believe that narrative 92 consensus, they would uh, fed up with narrative. So there got to be someone from KNT have, have trusts from China, but popular enough from Taiwanese people. I haven't seen that candidate yet. So um, we, we had Wonderful answers from everybody. And there's more questions in the q and A. I I would encourage the panelists just to look there to see what the audience members are interested in, what they're asking. A lot of good questions, great answers. And all of you have managed the time very well, except for me, because I was we were supposed to leave, uh, you know, fifth, how much, 10 minutes, 15 yeah. minutes for closing. Uh, remarks and so forth, but I haven't done that. That's think, okay, Andy, but if we could get Professor Liu and maybe Dean Su to say one last set of comments to give them a fair shot, that would be great. Indeed, and there actually are some questions uh, for them. One for Professor Liu is just kind of whether uh, the, the what you're telling us is that the Taiwan public is unrealistically complacent about the situation but uh, any other thing you want to comment and for dean sue there was a question that said that you're you're hoping for more international support but is that realistic this came from i think from charlotte lynn um because of the concerns of other countries about their relations with china but so those two questions were for you in the q a but also any as tom says any other closing remarks that you want to make Professor Liu, why don't you go first, and then we'll let, we'll let Dean Su close the session. Okay, okay thank you. Thanks. Uh, let me add one uh, very uh, small footnote uh, to what uh, our panelists have said about whether Taiwanese people seeing China's military exercise as bluffing. Uh, actually, uh, there was a survey conducted by the Taiwanese Public Opinion Foundation. Uh, they just released uh, the data uh, in August. Uh, it says that more than 68% of the respondents, uh, they think they are not scared by those exercises. So um, again, I totally agree with Minghua and uh, uh, to Eric as well. Uh, this shows certain kind of uh, people's feeling of fatigue about Chinese military exercises. 
And one thing to that strategic ambiguity, um, um, very um, little opinion about this is uh, for 92 consensus, I think this is one way for Taiwan to express this kind of strategic ambiguity. However, uh, unfortunately, uh, China right now, they just disagree to any agree to disagree thing. So uh, this is really um, a, a pity. Okay, thank you very much. Dean Su, you get the final word. Okay, thank you. Perhaps just two points. First, uh, just to respond to this question. When I mentioned the phenomenon of de-Taiwanizing and internationalizing of Taiwan trade on global agenda, I mean that uh, on global agenda, Taiwanese issue or Taiwan trade uh, is more and more important or presented more frequently on global agenda. Uh, but that does not, does that mean real stronger international support? I I am I'm not sure. So that means perhaps that two issues that could be delinked from each other. And second, perhaps and I will not really give a conclusion. But my observation of the Taiwanese attitude towards the rising tensions um, of Taiwan Strait and uh, the more complication uh, in the Strait between powers, I just use um, an example that we are located at really the center of Typhoon. So that means now Typhoon is really coming and the hurricane is quite uh, fierce, quite serious. But we are located at the eye of typhoon, so the weather is good. That means we have sunshine. We we are, but we know that uh, we know that typhoon is coming, but we cannot, cannot change it. But so far the weather is okay, so we just um, keep business as usual. And that is my observation. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um... Andy, I don't know if you want to say one last word. I'd like to close and just thank everybody, but, but go ahead. Oh, that's it. Thanks so much. This was yeah. very, very valuable. So uh, on behalf of the China and the World Program, uh, thanks to all the panelists. It was a really excellent discussion. It was a great way to, for us to kick off our year. I wanted to thank again the Weatherhead East Asia Institute and Julie Kwan and Andy uh, for participating and uh, especially our speaker and our co-host, uh, uh, Dean Su. Uh, for uh, in, in keeping National Taiwan University linked up with us. And we, we hope to cooperate with you in the future as well. And uh, thanks to the excellent audience, which was large and engaged. Um, so uh, thanks to all. And I'm going to close the session. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.